Hello, Facebook. We are live again for the third time. Can you believe it? It seems like we just started two weeks ago. Uh, so today we are doing another episode of deleted scenes. Basically, I'm going to talk about some of the things that didn't make it into the sermon, some of the ideas that lie behind the sermon that we just didn't have time to get into, but that I think are still very interesting or very relevant. And so that's what we're going to do with this. And I'm also going to introduce you to one of my favorite nonprofit ministries, one of my favorite uh, tools to, for teaching lessons and for learning the Bible. Uh, if you haven't already heard me talk about it, I think you're really going to like what I have to show you. So we're starting in the sermon. So this week's sermon, which is now live on the podcast, it's on our church website. You can follow the link that's in the description of this video. Uh, you will <clears throat> be able to listen to the sermon, and the sermon was about the renewal of the covenant. We're talking about the things that Israel was waiting for and hoping for when Jesus talked about the kingdom of heaven. And one of the things they were talking, they were hoping for was that God would renew the covenant. And we find language in the Old Testament talking about this renewal of the covenant. And as you hear in the sermon, we'll talk about how that all works out and connect all the ideas about how Jesus renews the covenant and what that was supposed to look like. But when you hear me talk about renewing the covenant, you may have a question. It might occur to you, but wasn't the covenant already renewed? Doesn't that happen in the Old Testament? Because the Israelites receive a covenant in Exodus, and they do a terrible job for about 600 years of keeping the covenant, and then they go into exile. But when they come back in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, don't they renew the covenant? So isn't the covenant in place during the New Testament? And that's the question I want to deal with today, because this has been a recent development for me that I've learned that we don't really, I don't think we read Ezra and Nehemiah properly. I don't think we quite understand what's going on. And I think that this is a place where we need to apply one of the most important rules for reading Bible stories. And it's this, do not assume that the main characters are always doing what God wants them to do. It's very important. Don't always assume that they're doing the right thing. Because in the case of Ezra and Nehemiah, what I think you'll find, as I have, is that they're not actually necessarily doing exactly the right thing throughout that book. And I want to show that to you uh, real quick. When I do, I'm going to show you using an uh, uh, outline of, of the book, and it's made by a ministry called The Bible Project. And I actually have a poster of theirs on my wall. They are based in Portland, Oregon, Go, Oregon. And what they do is they actually produce videos that you can watch for free on YouTube. Everything they make is free. And the videos, they go through themes of the Bible, and they also give you outlines of Bible books. This is the outline for the book of Revelation, which they, uh, they sent me because I'm a supporter, and I keep it on my wall. I love it. Um, I've also downloaded all of the outlines, and in a much smaller form, I have printed out the outline of the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. And this is just a good graphic illustration. And if you're not listening to this live, uh, what you can do is you can pause and go watch this on YouTube, and it'll help prepare you for what I'm going to talk about. Uh, the link is in the video description. So first thing you'll find, Ezra and Nehemiah are really one book. The next thing you'll find is that there's kind of four movements in Ezra and Nehemiah. You have the story of Zerubbabel, and he's the guy who begins rebuilding the temple. And then you have the story of Ezra, who leads the people in rededicating themselves to the covenant. And then you have Nehemiah who rebuilds the walls for the temple, the walls for Jerusalem, I mean. And then uh, at the end, you have this renewal of the covenant proper, which uh, I talk about in the sermon. But before we get to this section, I want to look at what's going on in these sections. Okay, So the beginning of the story, the people of Israel, or the, the Jews, they return to Jerusalem and they begin building the temple. And there's this episode that happens in chapter 4 that's going to have huge consequences for the future of Judaism uh, to this day. Here's what happens. They're rebuilding the temple in Jerusalem, and it says in Ezra chapter 4, When the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the exiles were building a temple for the Lord, the God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and to the hands of the family, heads of the families and said, let us help you build, because like you, we seek your God and have been sacrificing to him since the time of Esarhaddon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. But Zerubbabel, Joshua, and the rest of the heads of the families of Israel answered, You have no part with us in building the temple of our God, 
We alone will build it for the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. So the locals come in and they want to help build the temple because they worship Yahweh too. And instead, Zerubbabel says, no, get out of here. You have no part in this because Cyrus told us to build it ourselves. And this is the, that group that they reject goes on to become the Samaritans. They end up building their own temple, and there's a whole bunch of animosity between the two that builds up to, that goes behind the story of the Good Samaritan in the New Testament. And so these people, they're called Samaritans in the Gospels. So there's huge consequences because this creates a split between the Samaritans and the Jews that has not been healed to this day. But it's worth asking, did they do the right thing? And we kind of assume, if you're like me, you assume they did the right thing because they're the main characters and they did it. And the Bible doesn't say they were wrong. But if you rewind back to chapter 1 of Ezra, you'll find something interesting. When King Cyrus gives them instructions, he says in verse 4, In any locality where survivors may now be living, the people are to provide them with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with free will offerings for the temple of God in Jerusalem. So, Zerubbabel says, no, you can't help because the king said we have to do it alone. That's not true. The king did not say they had to do it alone. And second of all, he actually said they're supposed to get help from people. So that's not true that Cyrus told them to do it alone. But there's a bigger issue here going on, and that's the question, did God want them to build it alone? Is that what God had been telling them was going to happen when he restored them? And that's not what it says. If you go into Isaiah chapter 56, you actually see this prophecy from Isaiah. This was written 100 years or 200 years before the rebuilding of the temple. And it says that God will give to the people who are not part of the Jews, he'll give them a place in the temple. He says he will give them an everlasting name that it will endure forever. Foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord and minister to him to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants all who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it and who hold fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. So God actually said that his goal for the temple was that it would be open to everyone, to Jews and Gentiles. You even find this when Solomon dedicates the temple. He talks about what will happen when Gentiles come there to worship. So that was supposed to be part of the point of the temple was to be open to everyone. And if that sounds familiar to you when he says, my house will be called the house of prayer for all nations, you're remembering that from when Jesus shows up in the temple and he's getting upset because of the way they've turned the, the, turned the temple into this den of robbers where they all hide together and uh, they hide from the outside world when he's saying they should be bringing the outside world into the temple. So what it seems to show us in the Old Testament is actually, or in Scripture, is that they were not supposed to build the temple alone. And by deciding to build the temple alone, they created this massive division uh, between, Jew, between Jews and Samaritans that still is going on. There's still animosity and division between them. The second episode that we find in Ezra and Nehemiah is this encounter over here with Ezra. Um, and reinforcing the law. Now, that's focused around a specific issue, and this is a real tragic story where he finds out that a bunch of the Jews have been marrying Gentiles, and so he rounds them all up, and he performs mass divorces. The Jews force hundreds of people to get divorces all at once from their, um, from their Canaanite or from their foreign wives. There's a couple of problems here, again, uh, so first of all, the law doesn't actually say that they were not supposed to marry Gentiles. If you trace it back in the book of Deuteronomy, what they're referencing, it says that there's a list of seven nations they're not supposed to marry into because those were the local nations. It, it says don't marry these nations, but it doesn't say they can never marry Gentiles. In fact, the law of Moses is full of references to how they were supposed to bring Gentiles into the covenant. So they weren't the Bible doesn't tell them to keep clean. The Bible also never says that divorce is a proper re 
uh, resolution to something like this. It never says that you're supposed to use divorce to solve that kind of situation. In fact, Jesus you know, is clearly, is, is very famously not cool with divorce. Uh, of course, Jesus hadn't come yet, but even in the book of Malachi, who, Malachi is speaking at the same time. He says in chapter two that God hates divorce. So they're not supposed to be forcing people to divorce. That's solving a problem with another problem. And what some commentators will say is, well, they weren't real marriages because they're not supposed to marry foreigners. So it wasn't a real divorce. So it's okay. It's moral. There's a problem with that. First of all, we already said there wasn't really a rule against marrying foreigners. Second of all, if you go into Matthew chapter one and you look at the genealogy of Jesus, you will find several marriages between Jews, between, between Israelites and Gentiles that are part of Jesus's own family tree. You've got uh, Salmon and Rahab. Rahab was a Canaanite. Uh, Boaz and Ruth. Ruth was a Moabitess. She, that's actually one of the nations they weren't supposed to marry into. David and Bathsheba. Bathsheba was probably a Hittite. And Solomon, his wife, was not Jewish. So there's at least four places, four marriages in there that if Gentile marriages are illegal, then Jesus is not a legal descendant of David. He's not a legal descendant of Abraham. So if we're going to write off foreign marriages, we create a massive problem for genealogy of Jesus. So again, we have a pretty big question of whether it was right in the first place for Ezra to create these mass divorces. The third situation that happens is with Nehemiah. Nehemiah comes in in Nehemiah chapter 1, and his big thing is rebuilding the walls. He builds the walls of Jerusalem in order to protect the city. And that creates a, a little problem, uh, partly because in Zechariah chapter 2, it says, uh, Jerusalem will be a city without walls because of the great number of people and animals in it, and I myself will be a wall of fire around it, says, declares the Lord, and I will be its glory within. So Zechariah, who again is a contemporary of Nehemiah, is saying that the city is not supposed to have walls, even though Nehemiah came there to build walls. Now, of course, you, it's true that that is a, a poetic description when he says a city without walls. He's not necessarily talking architecture or city planning. But the message that he's sending us is that Jerusalem is supposed to be a city full of people, full of people from all over. And Nehemiah is clearly not on board with that message either, because in chapter 13, uh, we read this. On that day, the book of Moses was read aloud in the hearing of the people, and there it was found written that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever be admitted into the assembly of God. When the people heard this law, they excluded from Israel all who were of foreign descent. So again, we have a problem with foreigners, and this time it's not just that we can't marry them, it's they're not allowed to live here which goes against the spirit of the city being full of people from all over. And if you go back and read that passage, you may not have picked it up when I read it, but you'll see the problem within that passage on its own. First of all, they look in the law of Moses and the book of Moses, and it says they're not supposed to have Ammonites or Moabites living in Jerusalem, living on their land. So their response is to expel anyone who's of foreign descent. That's not what the law of Moses said. They even, they know it. They can see it right there that it says, get rid of the Ammonites and the Moabites. But in their effort to overcompensate for their previous sins, they expel all foreigners. Period. They're all gone. You can't live here. And this is actually the origin of the, a very important trait about Judaism that we encounter in the New Testament. And even to this day, which is this idea of separation from the Gentiles, that you can't eat with Gentiles, you can't converse with Gentiles, the Gentiles are dirty, and they will corrupt you. This, is a, this was a very important element of Judaism in the first century. And it goes against a lot of what we find in the Old Testament, especially in Isaiah. Isaiah, over and over again, talks about the mission of the Jews to be a light to the Gentiles, to be a place that the Gentiles can come and learn about God. We talked in a previous sermon about how that's what it means to be a kingdom of priests. They are priests. That means they represent God to the world. In Isaiah chapter 60, it says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. 
Darkness covers the earth and thick darkness is over the peoples, but the Lord rises upon you and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. So this mission that God has given the Israelites to be outwardly focused, to be a light to the Gentiles, it gets twisted around in the book of Nehemiah because they're so afraid of sinning, that of breaking the covenant again, that they cast out all of the Gentiles. And they set the tone for Judaism for centuries to come as being separate from Gentiles. This is the context in which we should read this decision that they make to renew the old covenant. When in chapter 10, they read the book of Deuteronomy and they decide that they're going to sign on to this covenant all over again. They even say, um, they bind themselves with a curse and an oath to follow the law of God given through Moses, the servant of God, and to obey carefully all the commands, regulations, and decrees of the Lord our God. So they're renewing the old covenant. They're taking on exactly the same terms as the covenant they had before. But there's a problem. Again, we have to keep asking the question, is this what God told them to do? God did not tell them they had to build the temple on their own. God did not tell them to have these mass divorces. And God did not tell them to expel all foreigners from the city of Jerusalem. God also did not tell them to renew the old covenant. What we find is he tells them to wait for a day when he will bring a new covenant of a different type. He says uh, in Jeremiah 31, the days are coming when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or one another saying, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. What he's saying is there's going to be a new covenant that's going to be totally different because it's actually going to change the people in the covenant to make them into obedient people. Jeremiah wrote this about 100 years before Ezra and Nehemiah brought back the old covenant. And that happens, going back to our outline, oh, I'll figure this out eventually. Uh, this happens in uh, chapter 8 through 12. And in chapter 13, we talk about this in the sermon, immediately people start breaking the covenant. They do no better than they did before. And so the, the new old covenant, or the renewal of the old covenant, is a failure again. And so when Jesus comes along, the people are still waiting for this new covenant that's going to change them. It's going to make them into people who can be obedient to God. Because they tried renewing the old covenant, and they didn't get it right. And it, it twisted around their idea of what it means to be God's people, so that they turned into an exclusive people instead of an inclusive kingdom of priests. And that's what Paul is going to especially spend a ton of time fighting against. He's going to try and undo this inward focus of Judaism. He's going to try and convince people that God's mission for the Jews was always meant to be outwardly focused. And that runs all through the New Testament. So that gives you a bit of context on the sermon that I gave yesterday. Like I said, the link is available in the notes here. Uh, that way, I don't know which site it is on your computer. Um, you can also... Uh, get a link to the video where this poster is illustrated and narrated. Like I said, I highly recommend the Bible Project. They do great work. Everything they create is free. You can download it on their website at thebibleproject.com. Uh, you should definitely check it out. That's our uh, deleted scenes for the day. I hope that you enjoy it, and I hope to see you on Sunday. God bless.